Hi, I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Good morning, this is Jonathan Small, host and producer of All About You. This program is broadcast every single week at AccessTV.org studios in downtown Hartford. And this program is designed to give a guest to give their life story. <clears throat> this morning I have a very uh, interesting guest who is going to give her life story and currently what she is seeking. My guest this morning is part of the Tom Foley's um, governor's campaign that's going to be running, uh, that's going to be for election this up and coming on November. This morning, my guest is Heather Summons, a candidate for lieutenant governor. Good morning, Heather. How you doing? Good morning. How are you? I'm doing all right. And you? I'm doing great. Okay. Could you kind of let people know where you were born and raised? Sure. I was uh, I was actually born here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a small town in Connecticut called Noink, a little fishing village. Uh, and it was a wonderful place to grow up. It was uh, probably storybook. You know, you could run around and... Um, every mom knew where every kid was, and mm. if you got in trouble, everybody knew about it. Mm -hmm. It had a, a little tiny grocery store called Universal that you could go and charge your groceries, and your parents got a mm -hmm. tab at the end of the month, and there was a little candy store called Carson's that's actually still there where you could go in and pick out you know, three Mary Janes and one brown cow, and it was very nice. It was a, an idyllic childhood, um, and it was a wonderful place. It was very blue-collar. Um, there was one house that was nice that was painted and fixed up, but yeah. everyone else was just uh, average people. Most people worked at electric boat as plumbers or electricians and or fishermen, lots of fishermen mm -hmm. or oystermen. And it's really changed, actually, in 40-something okay. years. I won't say how. All right. Almost 50 years, it's really transformed into something different than it was when I grew up there. But yeah. it was a wonderful place to live um, and... Um, I'm happy I had that experience. I wish my kids would have been able to have that type of childhood growing up, but mm. things really have changed. So I grew up there, and I went to a local high school in Groton, Fitch High School, and then I went to UConn, mm -hmm. and I studied economics um, and graduated and moved on. I, I did work uh, for Electric Boat for years. That mm -hmm. was one of my first jobs that I had. So I have um, a good understanding of the defense industry. Okay. And then I went on, and I... Um, had had enough of the defense industry. It was very male dominated at the time that I worked there. There was very few women there and mm -hmm. it was uh, quite an interesting place to work. So I um, decided I wanted to do something else and I ended up going into the medical field and selling medical products. And um, I would go into the OR with a different physician depending on what product I was working on and observe the surgery, observe how the product was that I was selling. and. For some reason, the surgeons would say, oh, Heather, I wish this would do this. So mm -hmm. I'd go back and say, you know, we really need to change this so it is better performing in this way. So finally they said, okay, we're putting a product development hat on you. You're going to go develop products. So mm -hmm. my career really morphed, and I became a um, person who developed medical products and set up teams of different medical specialties to um, to look at products, to test them. And then after years of doing that, myself and two partners or two vice presidents at a company I was working at decided, you know what, we want to do this on our own. We want to start our own company and uh, we want to be in control of the things that we're going to be developing because we see a need for certain things. And so in 1997, uh, myself and two partners developed um, a technology and started a company in an urban city in mm. Willimantic, Connecticut. Okay. And uh, since that time, it's been a long struggle, but mm. close close now to 18 years we've been there in Willimantic, and we have uh, developed a wonderful technology that um, has transformed the lives of many people across the globe. And um, it's made right here in Connecticut. Okay. We, we came in, and there was... Uh, no one in this Wyndham Bill, Mills building, and we t we have an entire building now, and we have about 40 some, some odd uh, employees. We brought people in that um, really had no jobs or skills or mm -hmm. opportunities, and we brought them in and trained them, and, and we've had over, for 18 years now, we've had close to 40 people working full-time, three shifts, and a product that's sold across the globe. So 
that is one of the things in my life that I'm most proud of. And, and the product's amazing too. Well, that's a pretty impressive background of your life um, from where you started at as a child towards where you're at uh, today. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, have you all, have always been a lifelong Connecticut resident? I have been actually. I've okay. lived in different parts of Connecticut, okay. but yes, and, and mostly southeastern Connecticut girl to tell you the truth. I've okay. traveled around, but I'm partial to my part of the state. Yes. But, and uh, yes, I love Connecticut. I, I think Connecticut has um, just this plethora of opportunities here, and we have these wonderful assets, and we're in this fantastic location between New York and Boston, mm -hmm. and we should be bursting at the seams with opportunities and technology and um, opportunities for our young people and an ability to um, make it affordable so that our retirees can stay here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason that I actually got into politics was I saw, I, I told you I grew up in this little fishing village, yes. and I saw my parents' friends being actually taxed out of their homes because of the punitive nature of the property tax we have here in Connecticut. And I thought it was really morally unfair that someone that had contributed to a town or a community for 60 years or 70 years, had raised a family there, had contributed and volunteered and um, you know paid taxes for this period of time, was now being forced out of their homes because of an unrealized gain on their home. They hadn't sold their home, um, but we had people that an example would be purchased a home for maybe $11,000 mm -hmm. and now are paying $35,000 in property tax Okay. because you can maybe see the water. But you know, that person's an 80 year old lady mm -hmm. that's been retired for X amount of years. And that really bothered me. I wanted to run to change that in my town mm -hmm. because towns do have an ability to um, provide some kind of ta property tax relief for citizens if they choose to do that. Um, and I ran, the first time I ran, I lost by, um, I think it was three votes. So I was, it was announced I won, I lost, I won, I lost. I had a recount and I lost, but I didn't give up and I ran again. I think the first time I ran was 2001. And uh, I ran again in 2003 and I've been on the council since then. I was the mayor of Groton. Mm -hmm. And... Um, well, excuse me, let's kind of get towards when you were first running for mayor before you would get to the council. Which particular year, time frame? Well, I was on the council for years. Okay. And then um, I actually lived in New London for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I ran uh, a New London campaign there where they had the first Republican mayor in 20 years. That's the, that's the campaign that I ran. Okay. That was Rob Perro. Then I left and I moved back to Groton and I ran again for council and I became the mayor. Okay. So, Groton is a really complex town. I don't think mm. people realize how complex it is. When I've been on the campaign trail and I've talked to people about the complexity of it, their eyes kind of gloss over and they say, oh, this can't be true. But mm. in Groton, we actually have three different police departments. So, mm -hmm. we have three police chiefs. We have nine fire districts. So, we have nine fire chiefs. We have... Uh, two political subdivisions within the town itself. We mm. have a city within a town and we have a borough within a town. And they each have their own legislative authority. So they have the ability to levy separate taxes. So I live actually in the city of Groton. So I pay taxes to the town and to the city. Okay. And uh, we also have the only uh, military base in Connecticut mm -hmm. in located in Groton. So about 30% of our students are military, which means for for us, we um, have kids constantly rotating in and rotating out of our school system, which makes it a very difficult to get your handle hands on, um, you know, what programs you should provide. And we also have a very diverse community. So we have um, about 32% of our population is um, either Latino, African American, and with that comes um, a racial diversity um, or balance issue within the schools because your schools have to have the same racial makeup as your town. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult when you have 30% of your students rotating in and out to be consistent with you know where your kids are going to go to school mm -hmm. so there's it's very complex but we've done great things in Groton Groton is very financially stable this year 
I'm proud to say we delivered a tax decrease to our citizens in Groton. Mm. Uh, we are home to Electric Boat and Pfizer's headquarters are in Groton, so we do have a good commercial base mm. uh, that helps um, offset our tax situation. But um, it's really a microcosm of the state of Connecticut, and we've done great things there. We have a good bond rating. We have a good fund balance, all the things that you need to do to make sure you have a stable community. And we've done this all uh, by really being fiscally conservative, but yet really providing people with what they need. We have a great social service program in Groton, and one of the things I'm most proud of is in Groton, we're all volunteers for um, you know, going on 12 years Counselors, the mayor, everybody, it's all volunteer. No one gets paid. Uh, there's no property tax reduction. We do it because we love our communities and we love our city. And and that's very different than I found across the campaign trail going from town to town. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, my God, you don't get paid? Yeah. And so, no, we don't. But And we do it because we love our communities. Well, the population in Groton is about 40,000 people. Um, I'm not aware if Groton has a strong mayor form of government or council form of government. We have a um, council, mayor, town manager form of government. Okay. And as I said before, we also have two political subdivisions that have their own uh, legislative authority. So if they chose that they want to have a council and a mayor, they can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's pretty complex. You have a lot of moving parts. We also have a 45-member super majority Democrat right now, RTM. So in our town, the council sets policy. We work on the budget. But the uh, RTM is the one who actually has the final financial say on the budget. So, for example, a few years ago, our council cut close to $2 million from the budget that we thought was excess and unnecessary. And it went to the RTM, and they added back in a $1 million. Mm -hmm. So um, it, you have to work with a lot of different people with a lot of different interests. Uh, but I think we've been really successful with that. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I'm a Republican, obviously, and uh, the, the person who's the mayor right now is a Democrat. Mm. And uh, before the election, she would say, come out and vote for Heather because we know she's going to do a great job. So we one of the really nice things that I think we have in Groton is that we haven't had um, this really bipartisan, um, unworkable relationship People are looking at it, whether you're Democrat, Republican, or independent in Groton. People are trying to do what's best for Groton, what's mm -hmm. best for its citizens overall. And um, that's a perspective that I really want to bring to this office because, yes, I'm a Republican, but I know that I'm going to have to work with people in other parties or with different interests or different priorities. And one of the things that I have been very good at is bringing people together for the common good to move the needle forward. Mm -hmm. um, and in my campaign, I have really talked about being an outsider. I've had a business. I've been a municipal leader for a long time in Groton, mm. but I have not been a career politician. Mm -hmm. And one of my skills is to bring different opinions together in the common good for whatever that is, whether it's economic development or childhood education or healthcare, and moving the needle forward so that we can move forward. We can have progress because mm -hmm. I feel that Hartford is broken mm -hmm. and I feel Washington is absolutely broken. We, mm -hmm. we have these conflicting parties that just can't get out of their own way and nothing is getting done. And the people that are suffering from that are the everyday citizens. They're mm -hmm. you, they're me, they're my kids and future generations. And we have to be able to get something done and move ourselves in the correct direction. Well, before we get towards your reasons for running for mm -hmm. lieutenant governor and being part of the Tom Foley's campaign, uh, do you feel you can do a better job than Nancy Wyman, our current lieutenant governor? I have to say that I believe that um, I would do a different type of job. Okay. I'm, I'm cons I have been saying since I took off or took the mm -hmm. took office took uh, the jump into running as a candidate that. I believe that if the people of Connecticut are paying for a lieutenant governor, then they need to have somebody who's accountable, and and there has to be more meat on the bones of this position. Mm -hmm. I am committed to not only doing the ceremonial or the constitutional duties of over, you know, seeing the Senate, mm -hmm. but I want to be an active part of governance. I have made it very clear to um, the 
Republican governor candidates previously that I want to be a municipal advocate, a health care advocate, and a business advocate because those are my strengths. Mm -hmm. And I, th I believe that the lieutenant governor should be in contact with every single first selectman and municipal leader around the state of Connecticut because mm -hmm. if she has her ear on what's going on in the cities and the towns, that's a direct conduit to the governor. So he has an understanding of what's going on. I never had that when I was the mayor in Groton. Okay. I never had um, the lieutenant governor try to come see us or talk to us. And I think that's a very vital and important function that the lieutenant governor should be doing. One of the tricky parts we have here in Connecticut that lieutenant governor is really considered almost a part-time position. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the only position I believe that you can actually have another job. Okay. And that's not something that I would do. This would be full time. I would um, be an advocate for all citizens of Connecticut and spend my time um, either as a, as I said, a business advocate. I've started a business here in Connecticut, grown a manufacturing company here in Connecticut. Um, what I have seen when I've traveled across the globe actually is other states marketing their state at very big shows, whether it's a medical show or an engineering show, um, I would be there with my own company and the town of Groton's information. I didn't see the state of Connecticut anywhere. I mean, those are the types of things that we need to be doing, we should be doing. Um, I think those types of um, responsibilities could easily be held within the lieutenant governor's office, not hiring anybody new, but putting them on that lieutenant governor to get that job done. Okay, let's take a break right here, Heather Summers, and we'll get back in towards your real, I mean, I guess your reasons for running for uh, lieutenant governor and what sure. you think needs to be done. Uh, this is Jonathan Small. I'm hosting All About You this morning with my special guest, lieutenant governor candidate for the Republican side here in Connecticut, uh, Heather Summers, and we will be right back very shortly. Thank you. This is Jonathan Small hosting All About You this morning with my guest, the Lieutenant Governor candidate for the Republican side, Heather Summers. And we're gonna continue with our conversation that we've been having. Uh, Heather, we kind of left off uh, explaining, you know, what you would be able to do if you was to be elected Lieutenant Governor. Uh, first of all, why did you decide to run for Lieutenant Governor here in Connecticut? I decided to run uh, for lieutenant governor. It's actually sort of a funny story. I had a, mm. I had a business in um, two reasons. I had a business in Willimantic, Connecticut, and the regulations that we have here in Connecticut for business are really stifling, in my opinion, t for business growth, which means less opportunity for individuals here in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And I have to get products cleared through the FDA and I could get a product cleared through the Food and Drug Administration in Washington, D.C. quicker than I could get a wastewater permit okay. from the state of Connecticut. And mm -hmm. I said, something's really wrong here. That was the first thing. And the second thing is I have 
um, a big span in age difference with my children. I have a four-year-old and I have kids in college. Okay. And my kids in college were coming home. Um, they had friends that had graduated. There's no opportunities for them here in Connecticut, even with a college degree. Mm -hmm. So imagine about the poor child who hasn't been able to go to college. What kind of opportunities is it? do we have for them? Yes. And I saw no opportunity for our young people. And I saw my aging parents and their friends being taxed out of their homes because it's, it's not affordable to live here in Connecticut any longer. Mm -hmm. So those two things for me really made me think, you know, I have a degree in economics. We have a shrinking economy. We're losing everyone under 30 and we're losing people over 65. Mm -hmm. And as the mayor at that time, um, we have one area in Groton called Groton Long Point, which is, you know, very exclusive. It's, it's on the water. It's very nice. But there's out of maybe 300 homes, and there could be more, so don't hold me to that. Okay. There's 70 for sale mm -hmm. because of the taxes. And what um, people have said to me is there's a new Groton Long Point, and it's in Vero Beach, Florida. Okay. We have to sell our houses. So all those things together, plus the the whole fact that I can do something quicker through the federal government than I can here in the state of Connecticut made me say, okay, that's it. It's time for me to put my hat in this race because I'm going to change this. I want to bring opportunities for our young people here so that when we send them off to universities that we as taxpayers are subsidizing, they have an ability to stay here. Mm -hmm. I want to bring opportunities for the student that maybe can't afford to go to college I want to bring them opportunities here so that they can stay here and then they can have a life here that they're proud of. Mm -hmm. And I also want to make Connecticut affordable so that people that are retired, we have a lot of military in our town. They're taxed on their pensions, mm -hmm. they're taxed on their social security, and their property taxes are out of control. They can't afford to stay here. Mm -hmm. I want to change that so that we can bring Connecticut back to a place that not only is affordable and has opportunity, but people can thrive and be proud of what they do and we can recover and get Connecticut back on track. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly right now it seems like you're dissatisfied with a lot of areas that Connecticut is operating under. And first of all, you know, obviously Tom Foley is running for governor. Mm -hmm. It's going to really be his agenda. But if something was to happen to Tom Foley, you know, if Tom Foley and yourself becomes elected this November, you would be in positions to instantly step in. So that's why I clearly feel it's important that people know about the lieutenant governor because just in case, like, you know, if the vice president, if something happens to the president, the vice president has to um, step in. Um, do you feel that you would be able to, if something, if Tom Foley and yourself gets elected and something happens, you know, not, not wishing anything bad, but anything can always happen in life, you would be able to run Connecticut as the governor? Absolutely, without a doubt. Okay. And you feel that as a business person, you bring a lot of business experience and expertise to the table, and also as a counselor and a former mayor, that brings a lot of political um, experience that you can also bring to the table? Absolutely. I think my combination is very unique. Um, I have been a business person in Connecticut. I have started a company with very little, I have grown, I've been a job creator. I'm mm -hmm. really proud of that. That's the thing I'm most proud of, that not only did we make this incredible product that has transformed uh, people's lives, I've had the opportunity as a Connecticut business person in Willimantic, Connecticut, um, to, and all actually all the people that work for me have had this opportunity where we were able to save a, a little girl's legs from being amputated using our product. Mm. And um, as a thank you, uh, their family traveled all the way from California to Willimantic, Connecticut after a year to meet our entire company. There wasn't like a dry eye in the place. Okay. And uh, for me, those that makes it worth it. It makes all the many hours and the uh, frustrations that you feel as a business person worth it. And, and, and when that happened, myself and my partners and actually all the people that work for me said, you know what, if, if we never sell one more product, this was worth it because this is what we were meant to do. And and we've had that experience over and over. So I'm, I'm proud of the product. I'm proud that we've created jobs in an area that had no jobs. Mm -hmm. And it continues to expand and um, has really been an anchor in that community. And I believe that that's exactly what we need to do for cities that are distressed. Willimantic is one of, of you know, a very distressed community. But if we can 
uh, provide opportunities for people within those communities. I mean, the people that worked in this company, they bought houses, they bought cars, they have festivals and celebrations for their children. Those things wouldn't have been possible if myself and my partners didn't say, you know what, we want to do this and we want to do it in a community that really needs the jobs mm. because we want to be part of a solution, not not takers. We want to try to give back. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's exactly what we need to do in other parts of, of, you know, other cities that are distressed because we have a lot of distressed cities in, in Connecticut. And um, I have some very specific ideas that I will be sharing with um, Mr. Foley on my thoughts on what we could do to help revitalize those cities mm -hmm. to uh, uh, really the key is to be provide opportunity for people. Mm. And and right now, um, you know, on this campaign trail, what I've heard repeatedly, not just in the cities that I visited, um, but in places like Wilton, where the lines for the social services are now out the door, which they didn't have before, yeah. is they feel hopeless. They feel like nothing's going to change and they are willing in some cases to just give up. Mm. And, and I'm not a I'm not a quitter. I'm somebody who says we can't give up. We have we cannot give up. It's not right. What what kind of legacy is that for our future generation, for our children, mm -hmm. uh, for your children, for everyone's children, and for our elderly? We can't give up. We owe it to our future generation and to the older generation to get in, to step in, and to try to work for change for everyone. And that's what I'm committed to doing. Well, what type of business? Um connections and what type of business influence uh, do you have or would you be able to have uh, with Tom Foley and yourself becoming uh, elected? Do you have any networking clout that you can kind of attract people to look at Connecticut to say that they would like to come to the state? And well, I think we have to, um, personally, in order to make Connecticut attractive for businesses to want to come here, mm -hmm. um, I believe that we need to change the actual the the climate of, of doing business in Connecticut and mm -hmm. I don't think it works um, you know we've seen uh, the current governor really in my opinion throw huge amounts of dollars at companies to prevent them from leaving mm -hmm. and he'll say you know here's a hundred and fifteen million dollars in a forgivable loan which is really a code word for grant for you to stay and you can move from Westport to Stanford to me, that's not economic development. That doesn't create any new jobs. If mm. somebody's gonna leave, they're gonna leave. Mm -hmm. We need to change the, the climate or the playing field so that businesses want to come here. And one of the things that we have to do is to get our liabilities under control. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a business person and you're looking at Connecticut or New York or wherever you might be, you're gonna pick the place that doesn't have these huge liabilities coming down the road because you know at some point when there's nowhere else to go, they're going to come after you to help fund those liabilities. So mm. we need to get those under control. That's number one, in my opinion. And um, and then we can do things to change the, the business climate. Uh, one of the things that I think would go a long way is having someone at the top, the governor and the lieutenant governor, saying Connecticut is open for business. We don't think business is all bad. Right. Without business, there's no jobs. Mm. Without jobs, there's no opportunity. Um, and that, you know, come here, this is what we offer. We have a great location between New York and Boston. Um, what I've, I've spent two days actually last week with a president of a very large company here in Connecticut who's looking to expand in the Hartford area. Mm -hmm. They want to be in Hartford. They have great ideas on how to create some really interesting, um, uh, innovative, uh, state-of-the-art, networks within Hartford. Mm -hmm. The things that they've talked to me about are transportation. You can't get goods and services around. You can't get to work on time is a big issue. Um, the taxes on things like gas and unemployment and workman's comp, everything is very, very high. They want to be here, mm -hmm. but we need to change the environment so that they can be here. And yes, I do have contacts. I wouldn't... Um, but none of my contacts are going to do us any good unless we can change the right. the uh, environment. And incentives are great, but incentives, um, in my opinion, really don't work if you don't have the base groundwork to make them be able to work. Because for me, paying companies to move from one town to another is mm -hmm. not economic development. Mm -hmm. um, you know, paying people to 
so they don't leave is not economic development. You need to actually have a conversation with them on what we can do to invest for small companies, small startup companies, because those, those are where the jobs are created. Mm -hmm. What can we do to make it easier for them so that they can create the jobs that we need and that they can be able to stay here, to afford to stay here? And um, I, we, we can do it. We absolutely can do it. We just need the opportunity. Well, you said one of your businesses, you employ up to 40 people. Mm -hmm. So that's a small business mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. And if you feel we have a strategy that we could kind of grow other small businesses throughout the state, and let's say be in a position to, you know, have 40 to 50 people, that would be something that you could kind of look at as you have a company that has 40 employees and here's a way that I can kind of attract other companies, of course, with some other changes with state policies mm -hmm. that could kind of grow our jobs on that level. And you think that would be a lot more effective than just trying to keep businesses moving from one part of the state to the other? Well, I think it costs the taxpayers an awful lot. If you know, I, I understand the $115 million did not go through because the company probably got a lot of bad press on it and said, you know what? Uh, we're not going to take this, but spending $115 million of taxpayer dollars mm. to move a hedge fund from one town to the next when the owner makes $2 billion a year okay. to me is not economic development. I would rather see um, either low interest loans or equity positions taken in small companies, obviously that are vetted, that have good technology or that have you know, patented technology and help them get the capital they need to be able to expand, obviously with constraints and with requirements that they would have to meet, because I think that is a better value for, for, for money. And I say that because, you know, you could have a company with 40 people. If you're in Connecticut and you're a manufacturer um, and you are using local sub vendors mm -hmm. and you are employing machine shops that do things for you around the corner and the plumber you're using is local there's a whole trickle down effect that you're not even that nobody takes into consideration mm -hmm. you know the the input and the taxes back to the local community are huge mm -hmm. even with 50 people okay. um so you have to think of it as not an investment in necessarily that company in that city but an investment in the whole state of connecticut because mm -hmm. i can say as a as a manufacturer here, we use local vendors. Everything we did was in Connecticut, except our sterilization had to be done out of state because they don't have it here. Okay. But think of you know the plumbers, the contractors, the the guy who worked on the floor, uh, all the machining and the tooling that we did it was all local. None of that would have been there mm -hmm. if you didn't have the the genesis to start this company there. And there is a big trickle down effect that you have to take into consideration, not just in Willimantic in my company, but in the whole state of Connecticut. And um, you know, obviously, my policies um, would be something that have to be run by uh, Mr. Foley. Yes. But in our conversations, he agrees that you do have to have precise. You have to have an economic plan for your cities for small business. You do. Uh, because every other ta every other state has one, mm -hmm. so um, you know we have things like New York offering no corporate tax in certain communities for ten years. How do you compete in Connecticut when you're a border town if your corporate tax is nine percent across the board and New York is zero? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to have some kind of policies, but those policies actually have to be measured every year, evaluated. They have to be something that people that are implementing them should be accountable for and you have to look to see whether they're working okay uh, because that's part of what you need to do well Heather this is a very important election I really feel residents needs to be able to come out and vote I'm going to extend this just to one other segment to kind of give your reasons why people should vote number one and then also why should they vote for Tom Foley and yourself when we come right back okay uh, this is Jonathan Small. I'm hosting All About You this morning with my special guest, Lieutenant Governor Candidate here in, in Connecticut, Heather Summers, and we'll be right back very shortly.
Good morning again. This is Jonathan Small hosting All About You, and we're going to finish up with our last segment with the Lieutenant Governor candidate for Connecticut, Heather Summers. Heather Summers, this is a very important election. I'm hearing so many different stories. I'm hearing people indicating that they're waiting into November to see how this election is going to go, and people are making certain plans that if the election doesn't go in favor of one party, they may be leaving Connecticut. I'm hearing so many stories about these are the last days of Connecticut's growth and opportunities. So I just want to kind of clarify some results and some solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I hear all the time that we talk about the college uh, age bracket of the demographics that's leaving Connecticut and not coming back because there's not enough opportunities and jobs. But very rarely do I hear about the people that are not able to go to college or don't have the post-secondary training that I in Connecticut that probably can't afford to go or don't have the options to go other places. Uh, what type of planning do you think you could implement with Tom Foley to try to address those issues of the people that are still in Connecticut and want to be in Connecticut? Well, um, I agree with you. I think that this is an extremely important uh, mm -hmm. election. I think that if we don't see change this November, mm -hmm. that um, Connecticut will continue to go in the wrong direction. Okay. So if I can stress to anyone who's watching, if you want to know anything about me, call me because okay. I am a change maker. We need to change Connecticut. And if you vote for Foley and Summers this November, change will be coming. It'll be positive. It, we will bring back opportunity. Look at the record for the past four years of Malloy. Mm -hmm. And if you're happy with it, then vote for him. Mm -hmm. But I can't believe anybody is happy with the record because it's really, really abysmal. Mm -hmm. Look at our rankings. Look at the increase in taxes we've experienced and what are we getting for it. Mm -hmm. um, if you want a new direction, you want new opportunities, vote for Foley and Summers. As far as education is concerned, I have a completely different view on education, I have to tell you. Okay. Um, I wrote an op-ed piece that was printed in the New Haven Register about Common Core. I am not a proponent of Common Core. Uh, because I think each child does not fit perfectly into a box. I think there should be standards. I think they should be high, but I think they should be set by educators, mm -hmm. not um, the federal government. Uh, kids in Groton, as I said, we have a military base where we have kids rotating in and out, probably need something very different than kids in Greenwich okay. or in maybe kids in Hartford. Mm. I believe that all students, all children deserve a quality education. Mm -hmm. Um, in Connecticut, actually throughout the country. But we need to develop an educational system here in Connecticut that we are absolutely, genuinely proud of. Mm -hmm. What I would like to see, and one of the things that I talk about in my op-ed piece is, and I've seen it with my own children, um, there's this huge focus in high school that everybody has to go to college. Mm -hmm. College, college, college. That's great, but not everyone can afford to go to college. Not everybody is knowledgeable about college. I've had a babysitter, for example, who um, took care of my daughter whose parents didn't go to school. She mm -hmm. wasn't sure how you apply, when you apply, um, and, and we tried to help guide her on exactly how, how that works. I feel it's almost, um, I, I guess I would say it is imperative that we as citizens of Connecticut, when somebody graduates from high school if they're gonna to go to college, great. But if they're not gonna to go to college or they can't afford to go to college, then we need to provide them a skill that they can use when they get out of high school and go into the workforce. Mm -hmm. I wanna see more crossover between the technical schools and the high schools. There is no reason, in my opinion, that you could not graduate from high school with something like an LPN degree, mm -hmm. where you could go right into the workforce and you would be able to generate a good income where there's jobs available where they need people and then if you eventually wanted to go back to, to college there's opportunities to do so mm. I think we do a disservice to our students to not provide them some type of skill now, I've been focused more in healthcare because that's what I know right but I'm sure there's other opportunities whether it be engineering or manufacturing um, you know, we ha I was talking to a couple of manufacturers. There are no people that know how to do CNC machining anymore. Mm -hmm. they're, they're all ready to retire. They don't have anybody new coming in that understands how that's done. Why can't we, as Connecticut, pilot something where we could provide different opportunities for students that maybe don't want to go to college, can't go to college, 
or somebody like my daughter, my older daughter, who really, really wasn't ready. And, and if she had an opportunity like that, it might have been better for her. Mm -hmm. Let's provide that. So when they graduate, they are a CNC machine operator, mm -hmm. or at least they have most of the requirements done. And if they have to take a few classes, they can, but there's not a big backlog at the community college. And um, the parents don't have to, a huge outlay of money for them to go back to school. Mm. And they, they have a skill that, that we can use. We have this generation of what I call over-educated, <laughs> but really under-skilled people. Right. And you know, I've traveled the world for my business, and I've seen um, education systems in other parts of the world. And I've tried to kind of cherry pick what I think works. And in, in Groton in particular, our technical high school is literally Literally 500 yards from our standard high school mm. so why couldn't there be more crossover between mm. those uh, and I think it's very important that we provide students with an education but also a skill when they graduate because it's in my opinion it's unrealistic to think that everybody has to go to college but I also think that we as a society need to change the way we view some jobs and say every job has value. Mm -hmm. I've taught that to my kids, whether you are the person who picks up the garbage every week or you're the you know brain surgeon or you're the person that's selling you something in this clothing store, every job has a purpose, every job has value. And I think we need to try to destigmatize the whole technical school. Mm -hmm. um, I, in, our, in our town, we have a marine science high school with a, I think it's a 500 student waiting list because people want something different than right. the standard, um, you know, high school experience. Um, and hands-on training, I think, is very important. And if we're paying so much for education, mm -hmm. let's educate our students, but let's think about what we're doing and educate them in a way that actually has value. So when they graduate, they can have an opportunity and become you know, somebody who can be proud of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to think about education as a whole in a very different way than we have. Um, and that's mm -hmm. not something that I've been able to talk to Mr. Foley about, so I'm not okay. sure exactly how he feels about that. But, um, you know, if we have, and I've seen it in Groton because we have a very diverse community. If we had programs, we, we tried to look at something called a healthcare academy where someone could graduate with um, either most of the requirements to become an LPN or, um, you know, I don't see when there's a reason why you couldn't, but graduate, you can go right into the workforce mm -hmm. immediately. There's such a demand for that, especially as the demographics are changing and we have so many elderly people. There's, you, you can't, I mean, LPNs can get jobs left and right. That's and true. wouldn't that be opportunity for a student who maybe couldn't afford to go to college or wasn't sure if they wanted to? Mm -hmm. Immediately. And, and I think we, we do a disservice to some students by not providing those opportunities for them um, at the local high school level. And, um, and those are some of my thoughts on education. <laughs> well, that's very important thoughts. Um, let me just throw in my two cents for whatever it's worth. Um, this show is kind of, we're in the entertainment media industry and Connecticut has tried to get into the television and film industry mm -hmm. over the past, let's say 10, maybe not quite 10 years, but much over the past five to ten year uh, time span. Um, Stanford and Fairfield County seems to be growing very strongly in the media field of the media industry, but it's not spreading throughout the rest of the state. Um, actually, last year I had the town manager of South Windsor, Matt Galligan, along with the consultant who, who've been working on the Connecticut Studio project to try to bring that Connecticut Studios here to South Windsor. Um, do you think you would have some type of um, ability to look at the entertainment industry to see how we can kind of grow that field to, or maybe to um, expand it throughout our state? I think that any industry that we have that has the um, viable viability and opportunity to expand should absolutely be looked at. I can't say okay. I know very much about the okay. entertainment industry, but I can tell you there's been a couple films in Mystic, okay. uh, which is part of Groton. There was Meryl Street and... Uh, Oh, the funny guy. They mm -hmm. they filmed something there. So um, we've seen what economic impact that has mm -hmm. to the town, et cetera. Um, and, but if there's, there's an industry that we feel collectively has opportunity to create jobs and to expand economic well-being throughout Connecticut, I don't think there's anything we should not be looking at right. personally. I think that goes across the board for everything. And if there's an opportunity in the entertainment area, then we absolutely should take a look at that. Okay. 
Um, you have a business in the urban city, Willamatic, that you mentioned. Um, I don't know if Groton really classifies itself as an urban city. I don't think it's like Bridgeport, New Haven, or Hartford, or Waterbury. No, it's small. The city Sm is small. Smaller, it's within yes. the town. Okay. Yes. But electric boats actually in the city of Groton, so it's a pretty large industry within the city. Okay. Well, first of all, the last election in 2010, Tom Foley lost by just over 6,000 votes, mm -hmm. and he lost the cities mostly. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, it seems like the Republican Party cannot gravitate towards your urban centers, that the cities don't, particularly your residents in the cities, don't relate to the Republican Party. They think you all out of touch. Mm -hmm. um, what type of connections do you have now with your urban cities throughout the state that you can kind of change that mindset that exists? Well, I don't, you know, I think one of the things is that when you come for this election, for everyone listening, don't stereotype okay. Republicans. Right. I'm somebody, sorry. no, so, somebody <laughs> said, well, how are you going to relate to average people? I'm like, Republicans are average people. Okay. I mean, there's, there's extremes um, in the Democrat party, there's extremes in the, the Republican party, but mm. I can say myself, I'm just an average person who's worked really hard in Connecticut. Mm. You know, I come from a middle class family. My parents live in the same 1500 square foot house that they've lived in forever. Mm. And um, I understand, I'm not only sympathetic, but I'm empathetic. I've been a single mom. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like to work three jobs. I worked as a waitress for two years to supplement my income um, when I was starting this business because we weren't really making that much enough money. Okay. You know, I worked all through college mm -hmm. just to s pay for college. So I've been there, I understand, but don't don't let fear tactics make your decision. Republicans are not all mm -hmm. evil people like people think. Okay. We're not. We're actually average people. What we want is to give people opportunities to have them have the ability to make the decision, yes, I want to take this job or no, I don't. I want to be able to serve you a job on a platter and say, do you want to take it? Because right now we don't have that. There are no jobs. Mm. But we're not here to take everything away. I'm here to provide opportunities for you, for your children, to get the best education they can here in Connecticut, to find any job you want in any city, to be able to live a productive life, to buy a home, to do all the things that we were taught as children are things that you're supposed to want. Okay. I want to give you that opportunity. And um, I think sometimes the Democratic Party, um, you know, I've heard it already, playing fear monger, saying, oh, you know, those evil Republicans mm -hmm. are going to do this to you if, if you vote for them. That's just not true. Mm -hmm. It's just not the way it is. And as I said before, if somebody wants to know something, call me, talk to me. I plan on spending time in cities. Mm. Um, I lived in New London. I love <clears throat> New London. My daughter works in downtown New London. Okay. Um, and I think that we need to, especially in this election, look past the labels of independent, Republican, mm. uh, unaffiliate, or Democrat, and vote on who you think is gonna provide you the opportunity to be successful, to provide an opportunity so that your child has a job, that your parents can afford to stay here. So there's opportunities, that's mm -hmm. what it's about. The Republican Party is about freedom, it's about opportunity. The Republican Party was part of the civil rights movement. Right, right. You know, people forget all that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, don't listen to this stereotypical, <laughs> like, you know, they don't like us and we don't mm -hmm. like them. Mm -hmm. um, when I ran for office, I knocked on every door in the city. Yes. That's just who I am. People, some people don't like that and they shut the door, but other people said, wow, this is the first time anybody's actually knocked on my door. Because I do care and the Republican Party does care. Mm -hmm. We care about Connecticut. We care enough that we're spending our time running for office, even though people say it's a lost cause. It's not a lost cause. We can get mm -hmm. Connecticut back. We can provide the best education that we can for all students in Connecticut, in the cities and the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And um, it's time for change. We've seen, as I said, the largest tax increase. Look at all the numbers. We're ranked 49th mm -hmm. in all the areas that we should be ranked number one. And we're number one in all the areas we should be ranked 49th. High taxes, no opportunity, really slow job recovery. And look who's benefiting the most in this time. It's Stanford. Yes. Where did Malloy come from? Stanford. Stanford. You so. know, come on. Um, I was going to ask you this question. And I, don't, I don't know if you just answered the question. Why should people vote for Heather Summers as the, well, the Tom Foley Heather Summers uh, ticket? Why should they vote for that ticket? You're going to trouble if you keep saying <laughs> that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> why, should, why should they vote for the Tom Foley Heather Summers ticket this up and coming um, November? I think because we are the ticket uh, that is going to provide opportunity. Okay. Think about it this way. that The legislative 
body has been one party rule for close to 50 years. Mm -hmm. Look at the mess that we're in. We need better balance here in Connecticut. It's never good to have one party rule, whether it's Republican or Democrat, you have to have give and take. Okay. And we are committed to moving forward a new direction of prosperity and opportunity for people here in Connecticut, for all people. Mm -hmm. Those are going to have to be your last words for this particular show. I really appreciate you coming down this morning, being my guest on All About You. And I wish you and Tom Foley the best of luck this up and coming November. Thank you. Let's have the summer. Great to meet you. No problem. Uh, this is Jonathan Small. I had enjoyed hosting All About You this morning with my special guest, Heather Summers, a candidate running for lieutenant governor with the Tom Foley ticket. And as I say every single week, there's a lot of good, interesting, different programs on accesstv.org network that you could always tune into. And as I also say every single week to people out there, have a very blessed day and keep the faith. Thank you.